Am I clicking? this man's persistence. I love how his friend joins in to ask for help as well. As if it wasn't clear enough that they needed some assistance, he joins in to tell, tell whoever it was that was listening or not listening, can we get some assistance? Have you ever been in a situation like that where you're thinking, is anybody even listening to me? Does anybody know I need some help? Have you, we all been there, been in a grocery line or something, wondering if anyone even notices that we're even in, in the room or in the store? I, um, I often play scenarios out in my mind of what would I do if. I don't know if I've ever been in a Home Depot and thought to pick up the big giant tube and ask for help like that, but I will now, I assure you, and I bet that you will too. Joy asked us last week, what would you do? Um, are we ready? And I have, I wondered all week, am I ready? And I think I am ready. And I wondered if many of you have wondered this week also, am I ready? And if you are ready, what are you doing while you wait? That's the question I want to ask you this week. What are you doing while you wait? Are you ready and are you prepared? Um, we moved into a new house this summer and you know how new houses have new sounds and new noises and one night in the middle of the night we were laying in bed and I heard that, that noise of, eh, 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 you know, that creaking noise all night long. And it honestly sounded to me like our house was going to slide off the side of a hill. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do if our house starts to slide? Do I grab my cell phone first? Do I grab my pajamas first? Do I wake up my husband? Do I call 911? What do I grab first? I'm just playing out scenarios in my head so I can be ready and I can be prepared. Um, what if a burglar breaks in? In the old house, I knew the good hiding spots. But in this house, do I know the good hiding spots? You know, you're not supposed to hide under your bed because in every scary movie, when you hide under your bed, that's the first place that the bad guys always go to look. So I knew that that wasn't it, but I wanted to be ready and be prepared um, because that's just what you're supposed to do. And I thought if I'm ready and prepared, I'll know exactly where to go. But scenarios never play out like you think they're going to, do they? Um, a lot of you know that over the last couple of weeks, my husband and I have been traveling a lot and that's not really normal for us in our house. And I don't do it really easily. I don't love to travel. And so I really wanted to be ready and prepared for this trip. And the first one didn't go so well. Everything that could go wrong kind of seemed to. We spent eight hours in the airport getting through security and it just went badly. So for the second trip, I thought I'm gonna be as ready and prepared as I possibly can. So I had everything packed and I was trying to keep my husband's you know, blood pressure down by not being unprepared. I had everything packed and we were, all we had to do when he got home from work on a Friday night, we had to go into the airport on a Friday night. Swing by the bank, get in the car, swing by the bank, drive straight to the airport, park the car and go. No problem, right? So on the way to the bank, at a big intersection, which is right before our bank, 
I look over and I happen to notice at the corner of this intersection a woman in a wheelchair getting ready to cross. And I didn't think a whole lot of it. We went into the bank and um, got what we needed to do. And then we were leaving. And now we're back at that big intersection, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes later. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the same woman still sitting there. But I, I guess not to be, you know, you're afraid I don't want to look. I don't want her to think I'm staring at her. I, I don't know if I'm being politically correct or what. I just didn't want to look over. But I thought I saw her mouth something to me. And I thought, no, I'm sure I'm mistaken. Mistaken. And besides, we're in a hurry. We've got to get to the airport. It's Friday night. It's going to be Friday night traffic. I've done everything I can to be prepared and ready for this trip so we don't have any holdups. And so I don't look over. And then out of the corner of my eye, I think I see it again. And then my husband sees it. And he says, Lori, I think that woman's trying to say something to you. And all I can think is there's tons of traffic and there's all these cars behind us and we're about the third car back. And I'm thinking, no, I, Mike, I'm sure we're wrong. I'm sure we're not seeing anything. And I look over again and sure enough, I see this woman what looks like she's mouthing something to, to me. And I look and as clear as a bell, she's mouthing, help me, I need help. And my husband sees it too and now we're up to the corner at the light and I'm thinking, okay, if I jump out of the car and help her, we're going to hold up all of this traffic. But how for a moment could I even hesitate not jumping out of the car and helping her? And so I did and she was, she had a strap tangled up under her wheelchair on one of the wheels that was going to um, cause her to not be able to go. And it was really hard to communicate um, for me to understand what was happening. And so I had to climb under her wheelchair and it's raining and, and physically, of course, I'm absolutely able to do this. And, and I thought, what, okay, what are, you, what are you telling me? It took me several minutes to understand. Finally, when we got this all figured out, I was so mortified with myself and how long it took me to be able to get out of the truck and help her that I didn't want to leave her and I hugged her and, and apologized for it taking me so long to get there to help her that I, um, that I, just, I just didn't want to go and I hugged her and made sure she was okay and, and the only motion that she had on her hand was her thumb that, that controlled this whole wheelchair. And when I saw that, I, I was even more mortified. I made her test the wheelchair and made sure that she was going to be okay and she signaled to me that she was going to be fine now. And we got back in the truck and then headed up to the wheelchair. But all I could think for the whole rest of our flight down to California was how could we race through life so quickly? that I could even for a moment justify how I might have missed something like this happening. And I heard a story several years ago um, an, about an interview with Donald Trump. And it went something like this. He was having a milestone birthday. And he said, I've done everything I can do. Sometimes I think it was a mistake to have raced through life all so fast. What's the next level up? The grass isn't always greener. I hit work and I don't worry. How can you top that? I protect myself as well as anybody can. I prepare for things and I'm ready. But ultimately, we all end up going. I don't know where I'm going. I don't believe in heaven and I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in reincarnation. But we have to be going someplace. I just can't for the life of me figure out where it is. I, the Donald's comments completely blew me away. He says he's ready and he's prepared. But my question is what in the world is he prepared for? I read somewhere that he, Donald is worth um, three and a half billion dollars and he makes 60 million dollars a year. And I would ask the question, what is he using his talents for? He certainly isn't using his talents for things that I think we would say are things that are necessarily godly things. I, I don't think anybody would argue that he has done some very impressive things. He has spent and invested a lot of money. I don't think any of his wives, his first wife, his second wife, his third wife, 
would argue that they've been disappointed with what he's spent some of his money on. But I would ask, has he spent and invested that money on things that God has asked him to do? If, he is, if he's answering the question, I don't know where I'm going, and it doesn't really matter to him where he's going, I would, I would beg the question that he is not spending him on what God has called him to do. We're about to go into a parable um, that Jesus talks about here, and this parable teaches us, Jesus teaches us that the greatest use of your life is to invest it in that which outlasts it. I want you to hear me say that again. The greatest use of your life is to invest it in that which outlasts it. The parable we're about to look at is, I think, probably the most practical parable yet. It applies to our lives because it shows us how God acts and reacts to us and how we act and react to him and how we oftentimes act and react to his blessings that he gives us. This parable in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, it's kind of a long one, so I'm going to um, ask you to pull out your Bibles and, and look at it with me, but I'm just going to summarize it for you um, briefly today, just to give you an idea of what it's saying. And what it says here in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, just again, condensed in a few for short sentences, is... Um, Jesus says here that the master is getting ready to go on a long journey. And he calls us three, three of his servants in, and he, gives, he distributes all of his wealth amongst them. And again, we don't know how many servants there are, but it tells us that he distributes his wealth amongst three of them. Um, he distributes it according to their ability. And then he leaves, he comes back, and he wants an accounting for what they've done with the, with the talents that he's given them. Those that have invested it wisely, he blesses. And those that have not, he condemns. That's the parable. That's it. Like usual with the parables, we want to break it down a bit. So I see several principles here right off the bat. The master's going on a long journey, and he distributes his wealth. It says he distributes everything he's got. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything we have belongs to God. None of it's ours. Nothing that we have, we own. Everything that we've been given belongs to God. He has given me some talents. He has given you some talents. Every one of us has been gifted according to what God gives us. It tells us in that parable that he gave us our talents according to our abilities. He's chosen what he's given us just like in the parable, he gave the servants their gifts according to their abilities, just like each one of us. Because we have always lived far away from um, basically all the relatives in our family, my parents and my husband's um, parents have always gifted our children with things that they tried to be creative and give them gifts that they could order online and have shipped to the girls or whatever, and our son too, but specifically the girls in this illustration. And um, you can see here that something that they thought of early on for our daughters were these dolls called American Girl Dolls. And they're period dolls, time period dolls, that come with books about when they were, um, in theory, alive, and um, stories about them. Now our oldest daughter got Samantha doll. Samantha's on the left, and she was, she was a Victorian girl. She lived, I think, in like 1904, and she had beautiful clothes, and she was kind of a fancy doll, and Erica loved her Samantha doll. She had velvet coats with fur-lined collars, and um, she had a brass bed with beautiful white linens and a china tea set, and she even had a cello, a replica of a real cello that she, in theory, played. And it had real horse hair strings on the cello. And, and Erica, while she loved Samantha, Erica never played with Samantha. Erica always was changing Samantha's clothes and arranging Samantha, but Erica had Samantha up on a shelf where she kept Samantha in perfect condition. 
Um, Erica didn't want to share Samantha. Our middle daughter, Emily, who didn't have a doll yet because she was too little, was always, she coveted Samantha from the day Erica got Samantha. And she would always try to go in and sneak Samantha down so she could play with Samantha. And she would, I would find her in Erica's room on top of Erica's bed with a chair on top of it and books on top of that trying to get Samantha down. And sometimes she'd even um, instill her brother in these, <laughs> these things and, and go in there and she'd be holding her brother up so they could get Samantha down. And then I'd hear Erica screaming, Mom, she's trying to get my doll again. She did not want to share her gift. That, that was hers and she wanted to keep it just as it was on the shelf, beautifully arranged with her perfectly smooth brown hair kept in perfect order. Finally, Emily, when she was old enough, got Kirsten. Well, Kirsten is a prairie girl. And Kirsten wasn't fancy. Kirsten had um, linen clothes and kind of a hand-carved wood bed. And, um, and, but Kirsten was loved. And Kirsten had been desired for so long that when Emily finally got her, Emily played with her and used her. Kirsten went with us everywhere we went. Kirsten went with us to Disneyland on Splash Mountain. Kirsten went with us to Chuck E. Cheese in the Ball Pit. Kirsten went with us to um, the grocery store. Kirsten went with us everywhere and Kirsten was loved. Anyone that came over got to play with Kirsten. As you can see, her hair, the braids came out really quickly. Um, and she just, she was treasured and loved. And when friends came over, they got to play with Kirsten. And she, she was shared and enjoyed for years to come. Well, when the girls went off to college, Erica took Samantha and put her in a box perf in perfect order with all of her beautiful clothes and her brass bed with the white linens and her cello and laid it all in a box and put it up in the attic. When Emily went to college, Kirsten sat on her bed just like that. Um, one night in the middle of the night when our son was about seven, because he's a lot younger than the girls, he came screaming down to our room that there were animals, lots of animals in the attic. I can hear noise above my head. And so in the morning when we went to check it out, um, we found that a family of squirrels had moved into the attic. And what box do you think they found the perfect home in? It was the box that Samantha was stored in. And they had chewed out Samantha's hair from the roots. Her beautiful white linen bed with the brass knobs and everything was completely destroyed. And everything about Samantha was completely annihilated. The gift that Erica had been given that she boxed away and never used was completely destroyed. We've got to use the gifts we've been given. Erica basically did with her doll what the servant did with the talents. She saved it because she was afraid something was going to happen to it. Her fears may or may not have been founded in anything, but it's often fear that keeps us from using our talent or our gifts. So let's talk about fear for a moment, um, if you will, with me, and some of the excuses that that causes us to use. When we look back at the parable, which person do you think was most likely to be the person to sit on their talent and not do anything with it? Was it the guy with five talents or the one that was given two? Weren't you kind of like me and thinking it's probably the guy that's only given one talent because he's thinking, I've only been given one talent. Why should I work hard to invest it? Look at my daughters. Wouldn't you have guessed that the daughter that never wanted to touch her talent, never wanted to share her talent, was the daughter that was going to box up the doll and stick it in the attic so no one could use it, no one could ruin it? It was going to be saved and put away? A lot of our excuses are based in fear. I'm just a one talent kind of person. I'll let the pros do it. Since I don't have 10 talents and I only have one, I'm not good enough. Excuse number one, I'm not good enough. I can't do as much as so and so. They sit on the sidelines, not in the game, spectating and not participating. They bury their talents. Excuse number two. God hasn't given me anything to do. But what do we see in verse 14 when you look at your Bibles? 
God hasn't given me anything to do. People talk as if we weren't given any spiritual gifts or any talents. But this passage right here indicates that each servant had his goods delivered right to him. Don't you see that? The master hand delivered each servant his talent to invest. You were created for ministry. In Ephesians 2.10, for we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Again, I'm going to say it. We were created for ministry. Each one of us was created for ministry. I love these passages. I have two more that I want to read to you. But I could stand up here every single week. Marshall and Joy could stand up here every single week and tell you our thoughts and our, and our heart about what we think, about what we would desire for you to do. But none of it is as good as what Scripture tells us. Listen to this one, 2 Timothy 1.9, where you have been gifted for ministry. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. He saved us and called us for ministry. He called us to do his work according to his own purpose and grace. And lastly, 1 Peter 4.10 based on the gift each one of us has received. Again, remember, we were given the gifts. Use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, it should be one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belongs the glory and the power forever and ever. If that doesn't tell you right there that you were given a gift and you were created to do ministry for God, I don't know what we could stand up here and tell you that would be different. God expects us to use our talents and someday he's going to ask me, Lord, what did you do? What were you given? We've got to use the talents we've been given or we're going to lose them. And we need to use them wisely for God's purposes. We get stretched when we are in the game, don't we? All of us have things that we think, I can't do it, I'm not good enough, but we're stretched when we're doing what God's called us to do. We see here that using the excuse of non-committal with the talent he wasn't in or he wasn't out, he didn't spend it and he didn't invest it, he just buried it, that's flat out wrong. And, and I think you're probably wondering, hey, why is it wrong to not have used the talent? But you have to think about it for a minute. If you're given a gift, and, and that gift maybe is something that could bless someone else, maybe that's why you were given that gift. So if you're holding on to your talent, and you're, and you're not willing to share it with someone else, you're not willing to use the gift, that God gave you, maybe it's not about you for a moment. Maybe that gift is about someone else. Maybe God gave you that gift, that very gift, for someone else to be blessed by it. You're just supposed to be the manager of it for a time. And we saw that in that, that verse just that we read a minute ago. We may have been afraid of failure, self-doubt. I failed so many times before. Self-pity, I'm never trying that again. Self-consciousness, what will other people think? If I give my life completely to God, will I become a fanatic? The fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap, that's Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare. But either way, fear causes me to make excuses for doing nothing. Okay, what about excuse number three? God is asking way too much of me. So in verse 24 through 26, the servant, wants to, the servant wants to put the blame on the fact 
that the master is a hard man. But the master turns it right back around, doesn't he? And he correctly places the blame on the fact that the servant is a wicked and lazy man. Ooh, I don't want to be called that, a wicked and lazy man. We get caught up in our fears, our self-pity, our doubt, our self-consciousness. But I shudder to think of some of the excuses that we may come up with before our pure Savior. Excuses of why no attempt was made to get involved of helping or serving others. Can you imagine for a moment standing before Jesus Christ and trying to explain why I wouldn't get out of the truck to help the woman in the wheelchair? Every one of you here on some level is a friend of mine and every one of you here knows me well enough to say, no, but God, she's a really nice woman. I've never seen Lori before not be kind, show a kindness to someone. But that's not how it works. You all don't get to stand behind me and justify that I was just busy that day. It's horrifying to think that I'm going to have to stand and be held accountable, that it took me an extra 10, 15 seconds, that I processed even for a moment I'm kind of busy here. I don't want to look over. I don't want to get out. It's raining. My hair might go flat. The traffic's busy. It's Friday night. We have to use what God has given us. We're called to use that. I imagine my excuses are going to feel pretty puny at that point. I heard a fable of a missionary that <clears throat> his calling was to go and visit these small towns and these small villages um, across the countryside and just kind of infuse himself, immerse himself into the life of these different families in these little towns and villages. And at this particular time, he was traveling with an intern. And they went to this one town. And sure enough, they found the house that they were going to stay in. And as they're walking up, the intern noticed that this house was the poorest looking house of the batch. Um, the fence was in complete disrepair. And the, the fence was missing fence posts. There was no gate. The roof had holes in it. Um, I think the windows were knocked out. The children were playing in the front yard. But they didn't have shoes on, and they were dirty. and. They walked up to the farmer and asked if they could stay with them for a time and the farmer invited them in very graciously and then ha asked them to have dinner with them. And when they went in to have dinner, dinner was meager at best. It kind of reminds me of that story of so stone soup. Um, there, was, there was broth, but no vegetables, no meat. And um, that night when they went to bed, they went out to the barn. And when they got to the barn, they noticed that the barn was actually probably the nicest part of the whole house. The cow, there was a cow in the barn, and the, bar, the cow was um, plump. He was well fed. He was groomed. His area was clean. The farmer had clearly tended to this cow um, quite a bit. He, was, he got up from dinner early to go check on the cow, and it was heated in the barn. And the farmer said, you're going to be comfortable out here because this is the only area in the whole house that has heat. That night, they all went to bed. And while the intern slept and the family slept, the missionary got up, woke the intern up and said, come on, we're going pack your stuff. Grabbed a knife and cut the throat of the cow and killed him. The intern was mortified and said, what have you done? This is going to kill this family. Um, they." they they will be devastated. And the, in, the missionary turned to the intern and he said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And they fled in the night. The intern was so devastated by what he had seen the missionary do that he decided to leave his assignment with the missionary and never went back with him. I want you to process this for a little while. I want you to kind of wrestle with this for a bit and we're going to go ahead and move on. Three expectations, verse 20 and 22. In verse 20 and 22 we see that he gave him five talents and he got five more. 
he gave one of the servants two talents and he got two more. So expectation number one, Jesus expects fruitfulness. We can't think it is enough to say we are being faithful if we aren't being fruitful. Jesus expects fruitfulness. Jesus has promised to help us do this if we abide in him. In John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit, and that fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. But we must bear fruit, and we can't bear fruit without producing fruit. Expectation number two, faithfulness is not just showing up. Jesus expects us to do what he asks us to do. He wants us to use the gifts and talents that he's given us. Be faithful with the gifts you've been given. Are you so consumed with the cow in your life? Are you so consumed with the doll on your shelf that you're not being faithful with the other things around you? You're not paying attention to what's going on? Are you being faithful with what God has given you? Or are you just protecting what you think is important? Expectation number three. Jesus expects us to take some risks. In verse 26 and 27, he wants us to be motivated and take some risks. The fear of failing can cause us to do some pretty nutty things. And one of those things is never step out of the boat. There are two ways to respond to failure. We saw it in Judas and Peter. Both Judas and Peter committed the very same sin, didn't they? They both denied Jesus. Judas let it get to him. Judas went on a guilt trip. He became depressed and he gave up. He quit. Peter, on the other hand, he wept bitterly. He told God he was sorry, and he picked himself up. Fifty days later, that very same man who denied Christ three times birthed the church. Three thousand people accepted Christ in one day when Peter preached. Can you imagine that kind of feeling of success? You've denied Christ, the man that you've walked the earth with. You denied that he was the Son of God. You denied that you knew him. And just 50 short days later, your biggest success. After 50 days, after his greatest failure, 50 short days, he experienced his greatest joy. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters where you're going and what you're doing now. What direction are your feet heading now? Are you going to take some risks? Where do you want to go? Not where have you been? So that brings us to the three promises. God keeps his promises. This is the answer to the test right here. In verses 21 and 23, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. The affirmation, well done, good and faithful servant. Can you imagine anything better than standing before Jesus and having him say to you, good job good job. I just, I can't imagine getting to hear those words. And I hope that someday each one of you is going to get to hear that. You did good with the talents I gave you. You did good. Then he goes on to say, I'm going to give you even greater responsibility. You've been faithful with the little things. I'm going to trust you with more. You're getting a promotion. God wants to do so much in your life but he won't if you don't allow him. You might be afraid of committing your life to Christ. 
Maybe you've been thinking about it. If I commit my life to Christ, I'll probably blow that too. And guess what? You probably will. But eternity doesn't depend on you. It depends on what Jesus has done for you. And lastly, he says, come and share your master's happiness celebration. I love that. I have to tell you that the absolute happiest people on earth are not the people in Disneyland, I know, but they are the people that are using the gifts that God has given them. I think back of Emily taking Kirsten with us to Disneyland and Splash Mountain and in the ball pit. She used her gift. And Samantha on the shelf. I only have about two minutes left. And I know I've left you with an unfinished story of a dead cow and an intern who's left his ministry. Well, the intern couldn't quit thinking about what, what the missionary had done and what the missionary had said to him. So he looked up the verse that he thought that he remembered him saying, and it's actually in Hebrews 11.6. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God. And he read a little further. For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. So several years passed and the intern goes back to the little village where he remembered that they were where the cow was killed. And he's walking along the street trying to find the home that they found, that they stayed at. And he sees the spot where the home was but he's not sure it's there and he thinks, ah, the family must have moved on because that's where the house was, but this house has a fence that's got all of the posts. And there's a gate where there once was none. And where the glass was broken out of the windows, there's real windows. The house is painted. The roof that had holes was all repaired. And there were children in the front yard that were happy and clean and had shoes on. And the farmer comes out and sees him and runs out to greet him and says, I remember you coming and staying with, come in, come in, come have dinner with us. And the farmer's so excited to see him that he shows the intern around and shows him their garden that they now have and, and, and sits him down to a meal that is bountiful and plentiful and yummy and full of vegetables and meat. And the intern's sitting there and he's so confused and he's wondering the whole time, Okay, what has happened here? And so finally he has the nerve to ask. And he says, Farmer, I've got to ask you. Do you remember years ago when we were here and um, that cow you had? And the farmer says, yes, yes, I, I, I remember. In fact, I think it was that night that you stayed with us. We think some neighboring villagers who were jealous of our cow came and killed it. And the intern just sitting there, kind of shaking his head and not acknowledging one way or the other. And he said, we were worried about you. We thought maybe something happened to you. And the intern didn't respond. And the farmer said, well, it's the funniest thing. He said, after that happened, we were devastated. We thought we couldn't go on. But then we realized that we put way too much focus on that cow. And we started to pray. We went back to church again because we had time, because we weren't so focused on the cow. We started to plant a garden, and we had so much produce in the garden, we were able to share it with our neighbors. And we were able to share, um, to sell some at the market and make enough money. We were able to fix up the rooms in the house and the fence and the gate because we were not so focused on one thing and it drew us closer to each other as a family. And the intern finally understood what the missionary had told us. Are you holding on to something that you shouldn't be? Like a talent that you're afraid to be using to invest for God? Do you have a sacred cow in your life? Maybe it keeps you from attending church or using your gifts? Are you afraid if you don't pay attention to it, you might fail? The only 
failure, the only real failure, is not responding to God's love. If you've never responded to the love of Christ, I'm going to invite you to do that today by placing your faith in Him, in our Savior, and asking Him to cover those sins of yours. When we bow our heads today, and I'm going to go ahead and ask you to do that now, you can miss God's blessing in your life if you allow excuses or the wrong expectations to control you. You can miss blessings in your life if you don't listen to what God's calling you to do. Step out of your comfort zone today and trust God. Some of you have been thinking about this for a long time, and I'm asking you just to take a risk. Ask Him to replace your fear of failure in your life and have faith in Him. If you're already a follower of Jesus, maybe He's asking you to do something that you, do ju you just do not want to do. You're afraid. I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith today. God, I'm going to trust you in this area with my time, with my relationships, with my finances, whatever it is that you have for me. Lord, I pray that each woman here would just seek you today, that they would know that you are the giver of gifts, that you are the giver of talents, Lord, and Lord, that you are the lover of our souls, that you desire for each one of us to know you, Lord, and for that woman here today that doesn't know who you are, that's been standing on the broken fence, Lord, that today you would fix that fence, that she would say, Lord, I want you to lead my life. Lord, and for the woman that's afraid to use her gifts and use her talents or doesn't know what they are, that you would help her see today that you know them and help her know them and lead her in whatever direction it would be that you would want her to go. In Jesus' name, amen.